welcome to you joining us today for this presentation on teaching tactics in virtual worlds. We'll be looking at how emerging technology can help bring us together in new and satisfying ways. My name is Steve Van Hook. I'm an educator and researcher, and that's what we'll consider today is research and results in virtual world education. No one is trying to sell you anything. Here is a brief overview of our agenda and a little bit about me. You can check it out later in the PDF slide file if you like. It's on my research website there at the bottom of the screen, www.mr.us. I'll share that link again later. We have lots to cover, so let's just jump right in. I presented on this topic for the Science Circle about a year ago, how COVID might impact education and our delivery of it. But there was a big question mark after just about every sentence. Now there's not so many question marks, but there are some pretty big exclamation points. We are likely to see some changes from what we've gone through over the last two or so years as we try to find a new normal, but it's safe to guess we're not going back to the way things were before. So let's look at how things might be. Uh, let's see what a London-based Global Health Foundation is saying. COVID is not going away around the world anytime soon, and we need to learn how to cope with it, thinking and planning and coming to grips with new ways of living, they say. And uh, those of us in the United States should keep in mind that more than 95% of the world is not us, and we need to care about that. If nothing else, we are all impacted by global supply chain disruption. Uh, I'll be sharing some data and uh, resources as we go. Much of all that comes from this assortment of articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, and other credible sources. Uh, I'll also be sharing links to additional research resources and some of the slides as we go. And uh, you can get those links if you download a PDF of these fly, uh, slides. And uh, you can find it on my academic website. I'll give a link to that at the end. Uh, I'll be focusing primarily on U.S. news and issues since that's where I'm here in California. And if it's happening here in academia, it's likely happening elsewhere or at least the fallout from it. Uh, here are two interesting articles from a recent edition of Inside Higher Education. COVID cuts and international travel have impacted educational uh, exchanges between young creative students all around the world. And that's just such a loss. Uh, organizers are trying out different online platforms uh, to increase and improve international collaboration for students. And uh, also virtual job recruiting programs are reaching out to populations of historically marginalized college graduates. Uh, they're also looking at technological uh, alternatives to do that better. Oh, now many are talking about the metaverse and uh, figuring out how to stake a claim in it. Here are 10 companies, according to Gizmodo, uh, that might actually survive all the hype and recoil. Uh, you can check out this story. It's got some great backgrounds and tactics of each of the companies, and you can get that by uh, clicking the link in the slide file. Uh, it will take you to Gizmodo. And of course, way up at the top of the list is, of course, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Uh, and, you know, it's great to see that uh, immersive virtual world efforts are so newsworthy. Well, that's a good thing. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg calls it the holy grail of social experiences. And it's hard to argue with that. However, one uh, virtual world long timer says the recent Meta Metaverse announcement wasn't all that innovative uh, or awe inducing. Uh, some of us have been there, done that uh, two decades ago, he says. Just check out the difference uh, between the Facebook Meta avatar and the contrast to a sophisticated avatar in Second Life. I just love that uh, you've got to be kidding look on her face. Uh, she's been there and done that 20 years ago. 
Uh, I'd suggest that uh, if virtual world learning is conflated with uh, the metaverse debate, it might ultimately do us harm. We're, we're not saying people should perpetually live in a digital world, but for the times we do, where would you rather spend an hour of lecture? Well, Zoom uh, is also trying to offer an immersive experience. Uh, it's there along with the speaker or gallery view options in Zoom if you have experienced hosting Zoom sessions. To me, it looks like uh, one of those cutout stand-up signs where you stick your face through the hole. And uh, why would people want to do this? They already don't want to share their video and audio in regular uh, Zoom meetings. I've lived, led hundreds of Zoom sessions. And I, I just don't see that working. But Zoom really deserves uh, some credit, though, for stepping up and stepping in in a crisis. But, you know, we can certainly do better. And we do do better. Case in point uh, is with all the Science Circle uh, presentations that have been going on for a decade now in virtual uh, worlds. It's a true testament really to what virtual worlds can do consistently with clear vision and good intent and an impressive immersive experience. Uh, you really, you owe it uh, to yourself to give it a try uh, if you haven't yet. We have this wonderful and real sense of place. There's context, proportion, exploration, tactile interactivity, and even games. And we don't get that in a Zoom class uh, where every square flat face is in your face and it's just exhausting. Uh, much of the time uh, we're talking to a room of shadow silhouettes uh, in Zoom. Uh, I've also I've just built a, a new virtual world educational region uh, taking advantage of some of the special nonprofit rates that are available and this is designed to serve first and likely only timers in a virtual world for single session seminars and simplicity uh, is the key uh, for that. It's just set up so they can just land and walk a little bit and then sit in the auditorium. There are minimal clicks, no poses, no automatic note cards, and that's to minimize the cognitive overload and system freeze. Uh, those of us uh, who find it easy enough now, well, we might remember just how overwhelming it was our first time in. Uh, sometimes the most difficult uh, educators to appeal to uh, are the ones who have already tried uh, virtual worlds and had too many challenges or unpleasant experiences and they're not uh, too eager to come back. Well, yes, there are some nasty and abusive stuff going on just like in the real world, but there are also wonderful free concerts and exhibits and lectures and experiential learning opportunities and just like the real world, it's a freedom of choice and everyone gets the opportunity to choose where they're going to gravitate towards. And uh, this new region uh, isn't so much to serve the educators that are already here in virtual worlds, but to to help bring them in for the first time and it's meant in the, as an example of why uh, to come and teach in virtual worlds. Uh, there are some uh, useful uh, resources at the landing, uh, the very helpful Virtual World Educators Manual uh, by Gregory Perrier, and also uh, some landmarks to sample uh, in world campuses. If you want to see what other people are doing, uh, you can zap me an email and I will send you some uh, directions on how to log in and uh, get here. Uh, there's really nothing new happening. Uh, interactive and immersive worlds have been around for decades, tapping old technologies, teaching and touching and engaging people where they live with an immersive connection. There was a show called Winky Dink that started way back in the 1950s. Uh, Bill Gates praised it as the very first interactive television program. And you had this magic screen on your TV set and you would draw on it and you could become engineers and tacticians and part of the program, uh, drawing in bridges and ropes and cages to help save the day. Uh, and encouraged children to be innovative and creative problem solvers. And those of us who couldn't afford the 50 cents for the mail away magic screen, well, we just drew right on the TV and of course got in trouble for that. 
Uh, the Gumby Show in the 60s, well, that let us break through flat dimensional world of physical books and into rich worlds of living claymated imagination. And my favorite were the uh, space travels. I still hear that theme song in my head here 40 years later. And then there was the inner space ride at Disneyland, and that shrunk us down to subatomic size so we could, oh, we could ride through molecules and atoms of a snowflake. And suddenly there was the red pulsating nucleus. And uh, is anybody here old enough to remember that? That was a number of decades ago. And, and you know, we're doing similar exhibits right now uh, in virtual worlds, aren't we? And uh, movies picked up on this as well, shrinking us down to cellular size to traverse a human body in the film. Fantastic voyage. Uh, it's still uh, worth a watch. And it's just, it's a natural inclination of children and students and even we jaded academes. We, we don't want to just observe something. We want to experience it. We don't want to just look through the window. We want to become part of it and share that experience with others. And even at just seven or eight years old, I felt this was the way education should be. Uh, Second Life founder Phil Rosedale said recently that one reason virtual worlds have proven so attractive to educators and students is our desire for company and experience in learning. We want to look at each other and see facial expressions and gestures, even if we're just sitting alone at our desk. And it's not just our desire for a sense of other, but also our desire for a sense of place. And immersion uh, is more than educational. It can also be formational and foundational. Uh, it's a low stakes experiment with modeling behavior. And here's a, a interesting article on cosplay and uh, the power of pretend, they call it. Uh, it tells how heroic stories and pretend experiences create an emotional response of elevation. Uh, and there's a link uh, on the story if you want to dig deeper into, into what that's about. Uh, for example, uh, in a virtual reality study, uh, those who were given the power of flight like a superhero uh, were significantly more likely to be helpful than those who simply got to fly around as a passenger in a helicopter. They, they got to feel a little of how a superhero feels in flight. And uh, that's elevation. That's what they call elevation that experience. Here's another example. Uh, studies show when people have an immersion into someone else's experience, it increases an empathic response. Uh, they can experience what it's like to switch gender or races or to experience life in a war zone or a wheelchair. Uh, and this could be helpful in human resources sensitivity training, for example. Uh, virtual immersion also uh, provides a sense of place, which is one of the most memor memorable aspects of an education. Uh, years after their education, it's the imagery uh, that remains, the taste of the experience. Albert Einstein said, it's that flavor of education that we remember once we've forgotten everything else we learned in school. And it's, it's really sad to strip that flavor away with a tasteless online course, uh, especially from those uh, who may have never had a chance to attend a real life campus. Uh, new technologies are going to make that experience even more immersive and realistic, tickling all our senses, literally. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been thinking about uh, the merging of virtual worlds and education oh, for a long time. And, uh, even spent $2 billion for Oculus with uh, the immersive goal back in 2014. Uh, I, I got one of those early uh, Oculus headsets and played with it for a while. Uh, my quintessential millennial uh, did too. Uh, we played some games and some educational programs and uh, we put it all down after about an hour really and haven't played with it much since. 
Uh, we felt the same way about 3D movies. I, I spot, bought the special glasses and the 3D player and custom TV and all the 3D DVDs. But, you know, we quickly got tired of that, too. We, we still love the movies. We just don't need to take it that far. It, it's not just the movies. It's the theater and the coming together. And sometimes the tech just gets in the way of that, I think. Uh, certainly, new technology uh, may make virtual worlds even more accessible on our smartphones and pads. Uh, right now, there are more than 6 billion mobile phones uh, globally, uh, 5 billion of them in developing countries, according to the World Bank. Cell phones are becoming ever cheaper, and network bandwidth is doubling every 18 months and expanding into rural areas worldwide. Uh, Internet-enabled tablets are the fastest ramping device around the world, and uh, solar-powered tablets are especially promising uh, in areas where electricity is iffy. And as we uh, consider technological access, we also have to consider socially appropriate access. How can we connect with a global student body in ways that are inclusive and engaging? Well, by necessity, uh, we will typically use English uh, as our common language. 25% of the world speaks it, at least conversationally, as a second language. Uh, but we should also consider a cross-culturally resonant context, culturally inclusive case studies and discussion topics. And by finding our common ground around the world, well, we come to better uh, appreciate and respect and enjoy one another's differences. Uh, it's uh, also useful to consider that transcultural tactics apply to subcultures as well. Uh, within any national culture, you'll likely find lots of those young and old subcultures, rich and poor, right and left politics, and uh, these tactics can also help bridge those divisions. Uh, and you can find a link to my UNESCO article on transcultural learning, uh, and that is in the slides PDF. It's there on my research website. And, you know, over 20 years, I've developed and uh, designed online and on-ground undergrad and graduate courses for UCSB, UCLA, California Lutheran University, Ellis University, National, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, more than half uh, of uh, the courses I've taught are online, so the place has been limited, especially uh, recently, to a learning platform, whether it's Blackboard or Canvas or Collaborate or Brightspace or whatever, uh, they provide a sense of gathering, but not a sense of place so much. So uh, it's given me a sense of what works, what administrators are looking for, what students like, even those, <laughs> those aren't often the same thing. Uh, and for 15 years, uh, I've been experimenting with virtual world education builds uh, for a few years of the science circle. Let me huddle in a corner uh, where I set up some sample learning demonstrations. Uh, and I've been pitching uh, these virtual world possibilities to my colleagues and administrators for, for a dozen years. And, you know, I agree uh, with many of the critics right from the start that learning in virtual worlds can be a poor substitute for the real life thing. No doubt about that. I wish everyone around the world could join me in a classroom at Kirchhoff Hall on the UCLA campus. Uh, what a beautiful building that is, uh, as these uh, Korean students did. Uh, it's a gorgeous building and it reeks of the finest academic trappings and tradition uh, and the ideal learning environment if we could do it would be a diverse and well-appointed campus serving all comers with fully equipped classrooms and reasonable numbers of students in the class and justly compensated instructors but this, unfortunately, is not where it's at, and it's certainly not where we're heading. 
Uh, it's also been said that the uh, ideal teaching environment is Socrates on one end of a log and a student on the other. Well, that's not going to happen either. We can't even build enough simple classrooms, uh, at least in the developing world, for millions, uh, if not billions, of aspiring learners. So uh, we well-intentioned and practical educators, well, we turn to technology uh, to fill the gaps, as we have for decades before. Uh, and this is what's ha happening in academia uh, over the many months since the COVID crisis began. Uh, but it's been more of a morphing than a revolution or a redesign. The transformational forces were already in play. Uh, lower state funding, a demographic dip in enrollments, uh, administrators stressing over budget cuts and program reductions. That's nothing new. Uh, however, up to 30% uh, percent of a university's revenue comes from dorms and dining. Boy, that's been a big loss over the last months. One dean uh, got in trouble for using COVID to further cut into tenure and shove higher paid professors out. He said, why waste a good, uh, good pandemic, he said, uh, right before he got a lashing in the media. Uh, there are uh, forces uh, simmering and expanding uh, for decades now, what we see here. And now the, uh, the blinds on many of our social systems are being lifted everywhere. Uh, and we can see clearer just what's behind the curtain. Uh, here are some uh, interesting, innovative steps that have been taken at the universities uh, where I teach uh, after covid closed the UCLA campus early uh, in the crisis. They put up a virtual campus in Minecraft. And uh, it was interesting to look at, but I don't think they've done much with it. Uh, it was paid for out of the Bruin Gaming Fund, and uh, that seems indicative of something. And at National University, uh, they're working on an artificial intelligence program to help engage students better in online classes. And the goal is to better engage uh, in the course discussions and tasks and to provide students with artificial intelligence suggestions on how to do better. And this may help uh, instructors focus more on other uh, tasks and resources, but uh, it may also worry uh, some that it's a short step between augmenting educators and replacing them altogether. Uh, I believe the best way to uh, serve uh, our students is to better understand them. And in the 20 years uh, that I've been teaching, the largest uh, group, the largest cohort of students working their way through the program have been millennials. Uh, they were uh, just turning 19 when I started at UCSB back in 2000. I have a quintessential millennial living in my home right now. Uh, and as an aging hippie from the 70s, I felt a special affinity uh, with the millennials. Uh, their older siblings seemed more focused on careers and earnings. Well, uh, the mental, uh, millennials seem more focused on issues and they have this get over it attitude towards racism and sexism and intolerance tolerance and bullying that, that I really admire, uh, their spirit of change and possibility. Uh, I think we, we need to better understand this new generation if we're going to serve them well. Here's just a few interesting bits. Uh, those in the uh, upper economic tiers of millennials are about to inherit some $30 trillion from uh, the retiring and expiring boomers over the next decade. And uh, more and more millennial heirs are, are saying they don't want that uber wealth. Uh, uh, news reports tell how many of them plan to give much of it away, uh, including the real estate and the art and the jewels and <laughs> No doubt that's a harsh news to their elders. And all this coincides as well with this great bulk of millennials and Gen Zers who are unable uh, to find well-paying jobs with any kind of future. And many are sullen and depressed with high rates of drug abuse and self-harm. Now, not everyone uh, wants or needs to go to school, but for those who do, uh, we can make learning more accessible and more inclusive, more engaging, more relevant, even, even more fun. 
Uh, and if predictions hold true uh, with rapid leaps in healthcare, such as 3D printing of major organs and nanorobotic surgery and better levels of nutrition around the world, uh, millennials and their near ge generational cohort cohorts, well, they may live hundreds of years and uh, may be the dominant demographic for centuries to come, and uh, we should teach them well. By the year uh, 2050, uh, some futurologists and economists say that artificial intelligence and robots replacing workers, uh, it may well entrench a new breed of people, a useless class of those not just unemployed, but unemployable. Uh, there's a link to the Guardian report uh, on this slide here, if you've downloaded the uh, file. Uh, someone said, it's not that they're born with two strikes against them that's so unfair, it's that they don't even get a third pitch. Uh, it's also, it's interesting to see that as a substitute for employment, uh, they predict that virtual reality worlds might uh, provide people with far more uh, excitement and emotional engagement than the real world uh, outside. Uh, these uh, virtual worlds, well, they also provide a sense of place and belonging that is so important to student success and retention. Uh, so much of the college experience is not sitting in a classroom. We can do that just about as well online. But the students are also looking to mix and mingle and play and party and experiment and socialize. And that's what they might remember and ultimately benefit from the most. Uh, the more that we can connect with them in the context of place, well, the longer they may stay connected uh, with us. Uh, here are uh, some key takeaways from a uh, webinar with Philip Rosedale. He's the, the CEO of High Fidelity and founder of Linden uh, Labs. And also there was tech evangelist uh, Robert Scoble. And they were previewing some emerging, uh, emerging technologies such as uh, Sansar back then. And uh, when asked about educational uses of the new 3D immersive technology, well, they gave an in-depth response. Uh, you can find a link to the video in session notes on the slide here. Uh, students already use augmented uh, reality and virtual reality glasses uh, to learn repair of, for example, million dollar Caterpillar tractors and Boeing jet engines with virtual overlays. Uh, or they may take a meeting in Yosemite uh, at a finger snap and study principles of gravity between planets by actually flying through the universe and visualize complex equations in math and physics and chemistry with 3D models. But uh, th they say the costs of virtual world design uh, may not come cheap to bring that all about. Uh, the uh, budget for the video game Grand Theft Auto V alone was some $400 million. And uh, effective virtual world learning experiences will also be costly. But the costs for virtual world teaching and simply hanging out and giving talks on stage, uh, these simple and inexpensive ideas are going to carry the day uh, where the physicality of place and manip manipulating with your hands is just magical, uh, say Scoble uh, and Rosedale. Well, here are a few suggestions uh, to those designing virtual worlds and technology for educators as we get ready for a showtime. Well, first, it's time to polish everything up and get ready for closer uh, scrutiny. Uh, online learning is only going to grow now that we've seen the need and the service it can provide. Uh, many students may not yet uh, like on learning, but more and more of them are starting to demand it. Uh, the educational platforms and programs that we uh, use need to better understand the demands of academia. Uh, old stodgy administrators who who don't understand the tech and just want to go back to the old ways uh, and the limited funds available and the overhead demand on students and educators to learn new skills and the Title IX horrors over privacy and harassment in virtual worlds uh, as well as simple performance standards universities need to cover uh, for accreditation. These are uh, issues we very much need to understand 
an address. Uh, I've been pitching virtual world learning to administrators for some 15 years, and this is typically what they reply, that there's just too much development time and costs, too high of a learning curve for teachers and students with too little uh, practical use. Now what we need, we need the accessibility of Skype where a single step gets you to where you need to be and we need the creative and simple filters of TikTok for design. Uh, we need the functionality of Zoom where slides and video and audio files are easily shared uh, with a single click. And some of that is already happening. Uh, and we also need to counter what may be a gaming uh, bias. Uh, virtual world learning may not be a game in the mind of its users, but others don't always see it that way. And I say, so what? Uh, learning can be fine, uh, fun and gamified. Uh, my go goddaughter recommended that I try the language app Duolingo not long ago. Now I'd studied two years of Russian in college and lived about five years in Russia and Ukraine speaking the language but I've forgotten most of it. But I relearned uh, lots of grammar and vocabulary in just two weeks on this app. Uh, it's fun, it's engaging, and uh, certainly educational. Uh, and I've got no financial stake in this at all. Uh, I watch uh, my goddaughter play video games often. Monster Hunter, League of Legends, Cyberpunk. Uh, and she sure seems to spend a lot of time just running from place to place and exploring in these games. And she says, well, that's what makes it fun, this sense of play place and space. Well, unfortunately, uh, we've also seen that the new technologies aren't always doing what uh, they hoped they would. Uh, students were given access to network computers to enhance learning, uh, but a Duke University study found that test scores in reading and math were actually falling, uh, and students in the uh, one laptop per child program were spending more time on games and chat and less on actual studies. Uh, and we must work harder to bridge the digital uh, divide, especially between rich and poor countries, uh, mostly split between northern and southern hemispheres, uh, and also between rich and poor communities. And we need to make sure the digital divide isn't further compounded by the content divide. We need appropriate course materials that connect and resonate across national, cultural, economic boundaries. And uh, that's an issue long dear to me. And yes, development uh, is very expensive, but somebody uh, is going to do it. There are many government programs uh, around the world supporting better access to education. Here's just a few of those. And there are some uh, supporting foundations uh, and familiar names out there. Gates, Jobs, uh, Sailor. Uh, and schools may also well be shifting money from uh, lowering classroom and facility costs uh, to new and better online options. Uh, and we need to see the big picture, uh, not just the view uh, from our own perch. We need to appreciate the practical realities of administrators, something that we teachers don't always do. And we also need to understand the desires and needs of our younger students. They're facing a very different world and future than we did. And we have to nurture the creative abilities and aspirations of educators and not just treat them like uh, machine cogs. And we need to embrace the ultimate possibilities and immediate limitations of learning technologies. And everything else uh, we need to do is just simply about teaching and learning and using all that we already know to its fullest. Uh, and we've done well at adapting to this virus crisis in so many ways. Uh, it's really been inspiring to see just what we can do uh, when we must. And so here we are in a difficult spot of preparing for, you, for a future still uh, so much in the fog. Uh, well, here's a couple bits of advice on what we might do. First, from a troll who says, when we can't see the future, we should simply do the next right thing. Those are good words to live by. Uh, and here's some advice from a 10-year sea captain. It's something I tell my passengers before we depart uh, here on the slide. There's a crew of German students from an international program at UCSB. Uh, and I tell them, keep one hand on the boat, keep one hand on yourself, 
and keep a weather eye on the horizon because yes we need to be very aware of our immediate times and environment for sure but if we don't watch the horizon for the subtle shifts in what's coming well we could wind up really really wet and that's it thank you so much for coming uh, here's a link to my research website. It's at www.mr.us uh, and you can find a PDF of the slides in this presentation with all their uh, active links. And hopefully we'll be back in another year to then discuss well how the world has gone from question marks and exclamation points uh, to maybe more low-key commas and periods as we find ever better ways to reach out and teach others.